Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. I will be in touch. Okay, that'd be good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, grab some coffee and food. You, you already have it that way. Yes, go off. You're with the Department of State Innovative Center? Yeah. Okay. So we're currently in the business department. So are you with Fountain Hood? Okay. Yeah, and that's the other piece, precision measurement. Yeah. Yeah. So I am the um, education policy specialist for Open Education Resources in the Higher Education Coordination Commission. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome. Yeah, and you're here to talk about um, the state of Oregon's perspective on... So talk about OERs, talk about the bill, talk about a variety of things. Um, so I was given an hour to present, but I don't... I probably have about 20, 25 minutes worth of Perfect. talking point material. Um, so. Feel free to you know ask a question during the presentation, or you know there should be time for questions afterwards. So I know Heather, I know Amy, I just met Jamie. Um, maybe the rest of you could sort of just kind of give me a quick um, sort of tell me who you are and, and what you do. I'm Meg Turner. I work in the career development department, and I also teach ESL classes. Oh great. I'm Lance Lanigan, and I work in the tutoring center here, and I help students with computer skills. Very important. Hi, I'm Lisa Hilliard, and I um, I work across disciplines. I, I specialize in adult basic education and career technical education. So I work in programs that oh, provide language support for technical education. Okay, perfect. And Dave, remind me of your yes. <coughs> I'm David Plantis. I teach part time in humanities, reading, and writing, That's right. yeah, and I'm yeah. serving as the teaching and learning center coordinator this year. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Okay, so glad you're here. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, so, like I said, I was, I'm going to just give you a sort of an update on um, what we're doing at the state level. So, just sort of an outline of what I'll talk about. I'll give you a little bit of background on the HB 2871 bill, in case you're not familiar with that. I'll talk about the textbook designation, which is uh, one portion of that bill. The OER specialist, which was funded through that bill, which is my position. And then I'll just sort of talk in general about the statewide OER program that's um, come out of the bill, and then we'll certainly have time for questions as we get, as we go through. So, if you haven't had a chance to look at HB 2871, and you need some absolutely riveting material to read right before going to bed, or you can't fall asleep in the middle of the night, I would highly suggest going <laughs> to the state of Oregon's w uh, legislative website, where they have both Senate bills and <coughs> House bills. And House Bill 2871 was enacted um, in the 2015 le legislative session, so you'll be able to find it there. So 2871 was enacted, um, put into law in July of 2015 as a result of a textbook affordability bill that was done in like 2012. So as a result of that textbook affordability bill, which really highlighted the fact that, um, as we all know, that textbooks are becoming less and less affordable to students and, and just adding to the financial burden that they have for um, completing college. So there's three main components of this bill. The first one, and I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail in the next slide, is that there is a requirement that institutions prominently designate courses that exclusively use open or free textbooks or other low or no cost materials. There is a second portion of the bill that established funds for a grant. So the grant um, is, is going on right now. It closes at the end of this month on May 27th, and I'll just give a little brief synopsis of what that grant is. And then, of course, it funded the creation for an OER specialist, which is my position, um, to help assist with uh, research and development across all of our institutions. So the first part of this bill, the textbook designation. So 
I, I think, and, and this wording here is, is directly out of the bill that says prominently designate, and I think the important word is exclusively use. So if you have a course that exclusively uses an OER or something that's low cost or no cost, we somehow need to prominently designate it. Now, from the HEC standpoint, we're not going to mandate how we prominently designate that particular course. We're going to, that's going to really be up to the individual institutions on how they, how they do that designation. So, so really the idea is, is when a student is looking at, um, the goal for this is, is when a student is looking at the course catalog, they're in the bookstore trying to decide on you know, courses, and I don't know if students actually just go to the bookstore and say, ooh, that looks like a good book, I'll take this course. But they need to be able to decide when they go in there and they're comparing courses that there's a course that has either an OER, a low cost or a no cost book, versus ones that might have a textbook that costs you know, $150. So really that is the whole goal for the prominently designate. And how you prominently designate, again, is going to be up to you. So it could be something like, something fancy like any of these logos, which I've pulled off of the internet and all have Creative Commons licensing, except for essentially this one here, which is Open Education Resources, because that's out in the public domain. You can use that one. You don't have to give any kind of attribution to it. Um, interesting thing is the two on the ends with the hands, those are um, UNESCO's global OER logo that they came up with. But apparently, according to conversations that I've had, that logo is not favored in the southern half of the planet because it's culturally offensive or politically offensive. I don't know how you look at it. So, um, and there was some debate that when UNESCO came up with this logo, they didn't sort of get everyone's wide opinion on it. They just hired a graphic artist to do it and they came up with this. And so of course somebody complained about it. And so anyway, I, 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 thought, it was a, I thought it was a cute logo, but <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. I don't, I don't really have more to say about that. Okay, so um, low cost. So here's another sort of caveat in um, the bill that it includes low cost materials. How do we define low cost? You may have already had discussions about this, but if you kind of broadly look across the internet and ask what is low cost, you'll see these arbitrary numbers, $40, $30, $50. There's no designation for what low cost means, and again, the heck is not going to make any sort of mandate on what low cost means. That's going to be up to the individual institutions to decide what low cost really means. And you could certainly argue that $40 for one person is really cheap, but for another student, that might be their entire food budget for the month. Mm -hmm. So that may not be inexpensive to them at all. So I know that in talking with institutions around the state, um, I've heard that they're going to some folks are going to designate fifty dollars as low cost. Some are going to designate twenty. Some are going to designate thirty. Some are going to designate forty. So we kind of got the broad spectrum. I've also had I've also had suggestions um, that maybe as a group, the twenty four institutions have a discussion about what low cost means, and we come up with some kind of across the board statewide. This is what low cost means in Oregon. I would leave that up to the institutions to decide if they really want to do that because certainly, once again, you could argue that you could go to different institutions around Oregon and your tuition is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Or you could go to a, you could be looking for, you know, a biology textbook. You could go to five different bookstores and find five different prices for the same textbook. So, um, again, it's just one of those things that, again, if it, it has, if it has a low cost as according to how your institution is defining it, then you will be, that will be a requirement to um, designate it. And then lastly, regardless of the copyright, it still needs to be designated as either low cost or no cost if in fact it falls under your definition of that. So for example, I used to teach a course um, where I had lots of online materials that I was using. I had students looking at videos. I had them looking at um, uh, articles and that sort of thing. And then there was a book I had found that was out of print. You could buy it used for like 10 bucks. I didn't own it. It was copyrighted because it was published like, you know, through a regular publisher. And at one point in time, it was 20 or $30 when it was brand new. That would still fall under this low cost option because it was only like $10. And it, wasn't, it, was, it, was a, it was a minimal purchase. So if I was still teaching that course and it was in existence and I was using that book, I would need to be able, I would have to somehow designate it as being low cost. OK, the grant. So the. Uh, other part of HB 2871 is that it appropriated funds for this grant program that funds, 
projects to adapt OER. So the RFA is open through the end of May, 27th is when it closes. I've given you a link to the where you can find the grant um, application materials. It's in Orphan, so over orphanorgan.gov, and I've actually given you the RFA number. Thing is, is there's several layers when you go into that site to be able to actually find the RFA. So when you, when you go, the best way to do it is when you go to the main page and you look at um, search by organization and then click under HEC because there's only one grant open right now, which is this one. So that's actually the easiest way to find it. And then a couple of weeks ago, we gave a webinar on the grant, um, myself and our grant coordinator. And so we actually have that um, posted up to YouTube. And this is also posted on our HEC website, which um, I'll have another link to in a, another couple of slides. Teresa, would you be willing to share your slides with us? Um, oh, sure. So yeah, I, I brought this. It? Yeah, I brought okay. this as a PDF, so um, you can have a you can have a copy. Fantastic. Of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so really, the purpose of this grant, I had lots of questions about. Well, look, we've got all of these OERs out here, so there's two right there on the table. Why would we go through this whole point of funding a grant? Well, the big the big purpose for the grant is to encourage adoption and implementation of OER. So what I've heard from faculty talking with people in various places is that barriers to adopting OER can be a couple of things. One, it can just be awareness. So just people do not have an, do not have an awareness that OER exists or that it's out there or, the, or really what they can do with it. Two, accessibility, and this doesn't mean ADA accessibility, but accessibility from, from sort of a faculty standpoint. How you're gathering materials, modulating them, adopting them, using them, and putting them together into something that's your own. And then availability and quality. So where do I find OER? What if I find something, and gee, it looks like it's written for a middle school level, but I need something that's written more at a college level. What do I do with that? So that's really the purposes for the grant. Um, and in, in a lot of instances, when I've talked with, um, and this has been mostly the universities, they've had limited funds to be able to give to faculty or incentives for adopting OER or even you know getting started in the process. So that's really, this is really a way to help kickstart that process. And then lastly, there was funds appropriated to fund an OER specialist, which is my position. So the idea for this is that the HEC has a staff member dedicated to OER. So that is all I do. I am solely focused on OER which is, in some ways is actually a good thing because I'm not getting pulled into various different directions, working on different bills. I am working solely around HB 2871 and how we can help all of the 24 institutions start using and working with OER. And I like to think of this taking a quote from Aristotle that I'm helping to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. And in this way, I think, and the way I think about it is in talking with, in, in talking with the institutions that I've already talked with, we've got this sort of broad spectrum of people using OER. So we have some that are just at the very, very beginning stages going, what's OER? What do we use it? Why should we use it? To others that are like, oh yeah, we've already got four or five textbooks and we've been doing this for a while and we've got things set up. So for me, being able to bring everyone together and putting, and putting all of those pieces together and connecting folks with others who may not um, have resources or may not be aware of it connecting folks that are already using things, that's really, that's really what I see my goal, in order to be able to gather information on a statewide level of how we're using and adopting OER. And really the purpose for gathering all this information then is to be able to assist and with the collaborations and promotions that are hopefully going to happen between all of our universities and colleges. So I'll, I'll, make, a, I'll make a comment here. The HEC has a software platform called Basecamp, and Basecamp is actually a project management software, software program, but it has a discussion board very similar to a learning management system like Blackboard Discussion Board or Canvas. So initially, um, the, discussion that was, the discussion board that was up was composed of members of the steering committee that did the initial work after HB 2871 was passed, but <coughs> excuse me, now I'm opening it up to any faculty staff that want to be able to participate from our institutions. So if you're interested in participating in this discussion board, please send me an email and I will add you to that list. Because really what I'd like to be able to do is get the community colleges talking with the universities and the community colleges are already well, well far ahead thanks to Amy Hoffer's uh, work with Open Oregon and her, Google, or her open Google groups. 
So there's lots of discussions going on there, but I'm actually hoping to bring in um, our university partners. And then out of all, and then out of all of this, continuing with with sort of my duties, I see that our initiative is really being outreach and extension, doing extensive outreach and extension between our seven community colleges and our seven universities. So how, what sort of form might this take? Well, it might take the form of workshops and webinars. It might take the form of conference presentations like I'm doing right now here with you today. Um, On-site visits, for sure. I, I would really like to be able to get out to all 24 institutions, see their campuses, see what they're doing. and really with the intent of getting faculty, staff, and student input. And I'm really interested in student input. That, as a former faculty,